I have a guest with me today that I have wanted to get him on this show forever, but this guy is even busier than I am. And uh, But he finally was able to make some time to sit down with us. He's a cop's cop. He's a police leader. He's a police trainer. And uh, and he's my friend, Chief Scott Hughes. Welcome to the show. Hello. How are you today? Hey, we are so excited to have you. So, so first and foremost, you're a cop. And so I'm going to ask you the same question I ask every cop or retired cop that comes on this show. Why'd you become a cop? Yeah. And I'm going to give you the standard answer that I give everybody that ever asked me that question. I don't know. I can tell you in the second grade, uh, my mother took me to a Kmart, which I don't even know if there's Kmarts around anymore. And uh, I got a photograph taken and I refused to take the picture unless I had a little badge hanging on my shirt. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I don't, you know, my father was a Marine. I think maybe some of that's in my blood, uh, just serving, uh, you know, but I, I've been asked that question so many times and I can never give an answer because I can't point to one event that said, this is why you're going to be a police officer. So. Well, of course, we all had that standard answer, right? I want to help people. Yeah. <laughs> I want to help the children, you know, all that yeah. stuff. I know. Yeah. I, the truth be told, my answer is I'm a kid of the 60s and 70s and I watch too much TV. There you, uh, go. you know, a lot of cop shows. <laughs> but, I didn't watch a lot of cop shows, but I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just something I always wanted to do. So here I am. Well, and here you are. So you have worked your way up, uh, you know, to police chief. I mean, you've had a, a very storied career. And uh, and and parallel to your police career, you know, you're also a well-known law enforcement trainer. Uh, but, I, you know, I've got to ask you, uh, Chief, what were you thinking becoming a police chief? What a tough <laughs> job that is these days. Well, you know, there were so many times in my career where I thought, you know, I don't ever want to be anything more than a sergeant. I don't I don't want to do anything besides be the assistant chief. And opportunities present themselves and I've always tried to view my leadership style as being a change agent whether I was a sergeant on the road sergeant in charge of a specialized unit an assistant chief wherever I go I just want to always try to make it better and an opportunity presented itself uh, in a community where that I've called home for the last what almost 15 years now and uh, it's a four-minute drive driveway to driveway and I was like you know what uh, I knew a lot of the officers here. I knew that they were looking for change. And they were looking for someone who's going to take them to the next level. And that's kind of what I've always strived to be. And be careful what you wish for, Betsy, because you just might get it. And here I am now. I'm going into my seventh year as the police chief in a thriving suburb uh, just outside of Cincinnati, Ohio. And I absolutely love it. And I talk to so many chiefs around the country who um, envious might not be the right word, but they are like, how do you do what you do? How do you keep these guys and gals motivated? They're constantly getting beat down by the elect elected officials. They all these activists that are coming at them. Uh, it's, it's disheartening. It's discouraging. And yeah, you're right. I don't know. There's, uh, there's a lot of places around this country where they, one, I would never want to work there. And two, they would never hire me. Because I would not come in and and uh, push this agenda that I think too many police chiefs um, are forced are forced to push. Well, and you became a chief a year or two after the death of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. Is that right? Uh, I became police chief in uh, yeah in March of sixteen. Right. So, so, and you know, the Cincinnati area is an area that has had its issues. You know, with with, uh, you know, police use of force and, and uh, you know, federal decrees for the city of Cincinnati. And I mean, and, you know, and and they've had issues with their community for, gosh, 30 years since I've been training yeah. cops myself. And uh, so you came into uh, now a suburb and a, very, and a pretty conservative suburb. But, you know, and then, you know, as you're the chief, you know, here you are, things are going pretty well, right? You know, 2016, 17, Law enforcement's, you know, pretty well thought of in this country. We got crime. You know, we're getting a handle on crime by 2019. Things are going well. And uh, and then, boom, 2020, the pandemic, first yeah. of all. Yeah. And then the death of George Floyd. What was that like as a police chief? You know, I have to say here for me um, in this county, 
we fortunately we did not have to deal with some of the the backlash and some of the uh, the repercussions. I think that the Chiefs had to have uh, just you know ten minutes south of here, right? And you get when you get into the into the county that Cincinnati is located in. Um, you know, we didn't have the marches and the protest, but I felt it, right? Just as every police officer around the country feels it, uh, even if it's not directly affecting your agency, it's still here on your shoulders and you still you still carry it around because, yeah, we weren't immune to you know, every now and again, someone making a, a, a sly comment or somebody would comment on your social media or whatever. Um, but, but, you know, you look at this whole recruiting issue and this whole retention issue that we're dealing with. And, you know, it, it goes back and we, we know this, you know, this better than anybody. It goes back primarily three years ago. And you started to see this, this, this blame the police don't hold criminals accountable, let people out of jail. Uh, judges aren't putting people in prison, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we all feel that, right? I mean, we make an arrest in this County, they go to jail. Now, if they get convicted, do they go to state prison or the prison's too full, right? So no matter where you are, that eventually does trickle down on us. Um, but like I said a, a few minutes ago, I really felt sorry for those police chiefs who were in in good communities, doing good things for the right reasons. And they, uh, this new person got elected. I'll, I always joke, you know, you get elected mayor, uh, you know, council that doesn't make you an expert in policing, right? Uh, it doesn't make you an expert in, in wastewater management or how to how to do economic development. Um, you, what you hopefully have is an elected official who surrounds themselves with 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 competent folks as as department heads, and then and then they'll make you look good. Is what I always what I always tell elected officials. But nonetheless, um, yeah, it, it 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 was certainly it was certainly impactful um, what happened. Uh, you know, following 2020 and where we are here today. Um, and there's a lot of chiefs around the country who are really suffering, really are. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of cops, right? You know, and, and, and you know, cops. now nine out of every 10 police departments is short staffed. And, you know, you, Scott, you're not only a chief, but you are also one of the best known police trainers in this country. So you travel around the country and you talk to not just other police leaders, but boots on the ground law enforcement officers. Uh, and one of the things that, that you do is you don't just hide behind that chief's badge or, you know, <laughs> you know, hide behind your desk. You're out there. Uh, you're incredibly outspoken. First of all, you're incredibly well-informed, but you're incredibly outspoken. You're out there on social media and, you know, you're, you're, you're calling people out. You're letting people know what's going on. And, and you've taken it, some heat for that, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of it's been indirect, but I know it, right? Like, you know, hey, something's changed here. And I I get it. Like, you know, I got broad shoulders. I can take it. Um, but, you know, my philosophy, Betsy, has been if, 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 if I, as a police leader, if I don't stand up for the men and women who are doing what my buddy would say is the hardest job in America, who's going to stand up for them? Like, who's going to defend them? Um I don't want to sound hypercritical, but it's been my experience. To your point, I had to go all over the country and I'm blessed and honored to talk, you know, tens of thousands of police officers over the last decade of doing this, uh, doing this travel around the country. Uh, it's disheartening the number of cops I talk to who they're leaving departments because they don't have any faith in their leadership. They don't have any faith in their chiefs. They don't get any training. You know, we want to do things like let them have tattoos, let them grow beards and give them external vest carriers and and put them on this schedule and put them on that schedule. The reality is this. Those are all great incentives. And don't don't get me wrong. I'm not a beard guy. But outside of that, those are all great and great incentives. But people are leave. They're leaving because they don't feel supported at their department. They don't have confidence in their leadership. And too many of these police chiefs um, are too quick to throw cops under the bus. You know, I, I I spend a lot of time in the use of force arena, uh, defending police officers and as, as an expert witness, speaking about use of force. I surround myself with a lot of people way smarter than me in that arena. And if 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 some of these leadership would just get a little bit more well versed in why cops react to what they do and, and and make some of the decisions that they do, especially under high stress incidents, 
uh, we may not have some of the problems that we have. Um, but it's really easy uh, when you're getting pressure externally from, you know, elected officials or community folks. It's very easy for some of these chiefs to be like, well, let's just remove him or her from the job and let them fight for their job back and and we'll we'll, we'll punt and see what happens. And that's that's just never been my style. Never been my never will. Never will. Yeah, absolutely. Thank God for that. I'm sure yeah. your people are thrilled because, you know, we just there a survey just came out uh, a few weeks ago. And, uh, you know, and, you know, you know, you're like me, you've been a cop, you know, and you don't, you know, you might get hurt, you might get shot, whatever, but that's not your number one thing you're worried about. And, and I know my generation of police officers, you know, we were worried about um, getting sued. You know, that was one of the things that we worried about. The number one thing right now cops are worried about is, am I going to get indicted? Indicted. Mm -hmm. How insane is that? And yet uh, that's not something that is outside of the norm and because of that, we're having a tough time retaining police officers and also recruiting new police officers to the job. Scott, what has to change for American law enforcement agencies to be able to recruit and retain good cops? Well, I think it starts at the top. I think it's and, and, and maybe even above the chief. Right. I think it, I think it starts with electing competent folks who are not trying to push their own personal agenda. Uh, you know, you trying to push a personal agenda or a grievance affects uh, an entire operation, right? So I think I think it starts at the top. And then it does allow that also falls back on the, on, on the agency head. Um, you know, I've been a big proponent and I don't get to do it nearly as much as I'd like. I do it more than a lot of the chiefs do. I'm a huge proponent of getting out of the office, getting in a police car, riding with your folks, um, you know, remember what it's like to be out there at three o'clock in the morning making a traffic stop. Remember what it's like to work a bar detail off duty and everybody around you is drunk. Like that's important, right? When your officers in, are involved in use of force. Um, we have to find ways to better fund law enforcement training. Uh, you know, because you know me uh, and the training side of the house, one of the biggest issues we have is that police officers are thrusted into these high stress, critical instance, and they're not adequately trained or prepared to deal with it because we haven't given them the training. And part of the problem is there's not enough money to fund the training. If I send a guy or a gal out today to, to, to training, I have to backfill that with overtime. Well, the state, the feds aren't giving me all this money to say, here you go, chief, uh, backfill it with, with, with this pot of money. Um, you know, here in our state and a lot of states, uh, they they want to put you in front of a computer and, and give your training in front of a computer. Uh, and that's just that's simply not real world experience. So if we're going to get better, we have to start treating law enforcement profession as a profession and not hold them to unrealistic expectations. Uh, like you, I spent a lot of time looking at videos and there's one that just came out the other day. And it's it, a male officer and a female officer. And a lady comes out. She's got a knife in her hand. And the male officer tells the female officer to taser. And, and she doesn't get the taser out quick enough and doesn't deploy the taser. And he ends up shooting her. And they're giving this female officer, you know, on social media, she's getting beat up because she's not using force. And I'm like, hold on a second. She's probably not ready for that, in, for that encounter. She's not prepared for that level of stress because we don't have enough time in the day to give officers what they really need. Sending you to a one day, eight hour class once a year does not make you proficient to prepare for the realities that you face out here. So. And that, you're absolutely that, right. And that, that case you're speaking of happened in a very small town in Illinois, right where I grew okay. up. Okay. And, uh, okay. and, you know, and this is the thing, you know, we've had three and a half years of, defunding the police and what you know chief what's the first things that go when somebody cuts your budget right community policing training things like that you know and and you're absolutely right we've been talking about this since the 90s cops want to be professional and we want to be seen as being professionals i came from an agency where you couldn't even apply at one time unless you had a bachelor's degree mm -hmm. and now we, you know, we're to, now we're like, oh, well, if you got a GED and you can breathe, you know, we'll hire you, you know, <laughs> right. yeah, literally the, this defund the police and the vilification of police 
has led to exactly what the opposite of what all the keyboard keyboard warriors and experts talk about. Why don't have cops? Why don't cops have more training? Why aren't they more professional? Uh, you know, why don't we hold have higher standards? In reality, we've got less training. We've had to lower standards. And uh, and and who does that impact? It, it impacts the public, the people that we're supposed to be protecting. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I, I I feel like I just saw an article too where there's there's a police department I believe on the West Coast now that's hiring folks who aren't even U.S. citizens. LAPD. There's, yeah, I mean they're they're that desperate for bodies, and I just you know you've heard this a bazillion times. I'm sure your viewers have too. But there there were times where one department had one opening, you would have hundreds and hundreds of people applying for it. And now most of these police departments in the country, they can't get anybody to show up. Um, and that, that the scary part of that also is, you know, that some of these departments, like they're hiring, they're, 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 they're lowering their standards, but they're hiring. You think in three to five years from now, those are your supervisors. Mm -hmm. And in five years from there, these are your mid-level manager, managers, excuse me. And then in, in two decades, those are your chiefs. And that's what really concerns me too, is if they don't develop to the point that we need them to develop, or they don't get the skills and the education that they need, what's that look like in the long term from a, from a, uh, you know, a leadership and a management perspective. So, you know, we see this, um, you know, cause you're a city police chief, and this is something I end up explaining to especially reporters not just reporters here in the United States, but from other countries, you know, our system of policing in the United States is very decentralized by design. It's very constitutional. You know, you were hired by a mayor and a city council who the people of your community elected. Uh, that's how it's supposed to work. And uh, and yet we see this uh, and we've seen it for a couple of decades now, uh, this federal encroachment yeah. uh, into our cities and our county law enforcement agencies, you know, through consent decrees, how dangerous is that chief when the federal government gets overly involved in local law enforcement? Well, I think you, you answered, the, you already answered it. The, what's good for my community may not be good for your community. What the level, the type of policing that my residents want may not work in uh, your community. Uh, my residents are fine with uh, aggressive, proactive policing to keep criminals out and to to proactively go after the criminal element. That may not work in some departments. Um, the flip to that is my community doesn't want you to be reactive. They want us out there stopping cars, um, getting guns off the streets and drugs off the streets and wanting people off the streets. And, and fortunately for me, every community that I've worked at, uh, that's been the philosophy. So it's all I know. Uh, which is good, which is good, because I think we're, I think it's, there's too many departments out there that are reactive. And to your point a few minutes ago, you can look at, you can look at many uh, quick Google searches of crime rates and homicide rates in communities where the police are basically told either officially or it's applied, implied, excuse me, that we don't want you out doing anything, right? Just you know, and, and we joke, and when I teach, we joke that you could go 25, 30 years and never really do anything in this job. And some of the, some departments advocate for that and heck, some of them, they promote you. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, you know, the, uh, we don't, we don't necessarily want, uh, what's good for one isn't good for the other. Right. And uh, I can tell you that here in Ohio, I feel pretty confident saying that I don't, I don't think that would go over well. I'm not sure that's the answer in every state across the country, but I think you're on it. I think that's the direction that some would like to head is a federal policing standard or, you know, a almost like a federal playbook. And I just, no thanks. Right. It won't, it, it won't work. That's not, that's not how the United States is set up. Right. Um, you know, as a use of force expert and a, and a use of force trainer, as you talk to law enforcement officers around the country, are you seeing their concerns about, you know, am I going to get arrested or indicted or or whatever? Are you seeing hesitation or at least a concern for that around the country? Absolutely. In fact, I just answered a tweet today uh, where someone made a comment about a police officer being hesitant to use force. And what you're seeing is you're seeing cases where officers are putting themselves in jeopardy to avoid using force. And in some of these cases, it's turned tragic. 
Um, the flip side of that is there's a there there's one police chief I know of who actually terminated somebody to actually actually uh, probationary probationarily released two employees for not using deadly force in, in a deadly force encounter and that's that that's really rare. Um, but yeah, you're seeing uh, and again you can pull up these videos yourself. You're seeing cases where officers are are, are uh, clearly justified to use deadly force, whether the person's got a knife in their hand, they've got a gun in their hand, and they're and they're they're reluctant. And when you talk to them later, um, it's it's the fear of being the next YouTube sensation, being the next Michael Brown, being the next whomever uh, who was clearly justified in the moment, and they were still uh, vilified, if you will, for, for their actions and. And you can add the race. You can start adding a sex component in there, and it just—it's just a—it's just, just a nasty, slippery slope that I think a lot of these officers are willing to say, "Hey, look, I'll put myself in risk before I have to use force." And I never thought we would get there. I think we've always done a really good job. Uh, you know, de-escalation. Everybody throws out the word de-escalation, and we've—we've we've been de-escalating since police work started. I mean, you know. Ah, Chief, I wish we had so much more time, but we just have a few yeah. seconds left. Where can people find you on X? Because people, you got to follow this guy on X. Uh, where can they find your social media? So Twitter or X is uh, Chief S. Hughes. So Chief and then S and then Hughes. And you can find me on LinkedIn. Just my name, Scott Hughes. All right, Chief. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. And if you'd like more information about the National Police Association, visit us at nationalpolice.org. Last year, law enforcement officers were involved in hundreds of thousands of use of force incidents. A use of force incident is when an officer must use nonverbal tactics to gain control of a dangerous situation. Put the knife on the ground. In many cases, officers have no choice but to use force when a suspect doesn't comply with a lawful order. Use of force is always ugly. No one likes it, especially police officers. Together, we can help de-escalate these dangerous encounters. Help police officers by complying with their lawful orders. Don't attack, attempt to disarm, or flee from an officer. Use of force is an officer's last option. Most incidents can be avoided by not resisting arrest. If you feel you've been wrongfully detained by a police officer, then seek a legal solution after the encounter has been resolved. Let's keep everyone safe. Comply now and complain later.